All right, we get started. Yeah, let's go ahead and kick this off. Um, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the second of two meetings uh, to discuss the rezoning of the Greater Scots Edition neighborhood. Uh, my name is Will Palmquist. I'm a planner here in the Department of Planning and Development Review. Um, I also have um, with me uh, other colleagues from PDR, um, including Maritza Pichin, who will be giving some background information about uh, Richmond 300 and the vision for the area, uh, as well as Marianne Pitts, Yesenia Revia, uh, Rich Saunders, and Emily Routman, who will all be on hand to help answer questions and facilitate the meeting. Um, basically, the meeting is going to be similar to last time. We have a, a Brief presentation similar to the last one, but much shorter this time around. Uh, we're going to leave a lot of time at the end for, for Q&A. Uh, everyone is muted currently. Um, we're going to save questions for the end, but you should be able to type questions into chats. If they, uh, if they come to mind, just type them in and we'll read them out at the end of the presentation. Uh, the meeting's being recorded for posterity and will be posted on the uh, rezoning website for folks who can't make this meeting who want to watch uh, the presentation. The uh, PowerPoint for the meeting is already posted on the uh, Richmond's rezoning website. So if you have a hard time seeing the presentation through this platform, you can uh, just look at the PDF directly as well. Uh, I think that's it as far as housekeeping. So um, I will. Uh, have uh, Maritza kick it off. She's going to give a little bit of background about Richmond 300, and then I'll take over with uh, the actual uh, rezoning presentation from there. So Maritza, take it away. Thank you, Will. My name is Maritza Pichin. I am in charge of the Office of Equitable Development with the city, which is essentially charged with overseeing the implementation of the citywide master plan. So if you go to the next slide, the vision for the citywide master plan is to create a welcoming, inclusive, diverse, innovative, and equitable city of thriving neighborhoods, ensuring a high quality of life for all. So this is a vision um, that resulted from a lot of community engagement. Um, and there are five topics, 17 goals, 70 strategies, and over um, 400 70 objectives and over 400 strategies to implement that vision because um, it is a pretty lofty vision for 2037. So we distilled the all of that into six big moves. So there's six big things that the map that the city is working on advancing over the next five years. That doesn't mean that the other things in the plan aren't happening. It's just these are the things that we're focusing um, the most of our efforts on um, and that's rewriting the zoning ordinance reimagining priority growth nodes, expanding housing opportunities, providing greenways and parks for all, reconnecting the city, specifically focusing on the Jackson Ward area to heal the wound of the highway that destroyed the neighborhood, um, and then also realigning city facilities and really thinking about how to reposition our city facilities for 21st century. Um, so one of the big moves is reimagining priority growth nodes and Greater Scots Edition is one of those nodes. Um, and you kind of see that um, the other big moves of rewriting the zoning ordinance, expanding housing opportunities, um, greenways and parks, and realigning city facilities, all of those kind of can get also accomplished through the priority growth nodes. So they, they are interrelated. So on the next slide, um, the priority growth node for Scott's edition, you can see where it is. You can also see the location of the other priority growth nodes. Um, and the master plan outlines these prior, primary next steps for the city to undertake. And one of them is the rezoning. Another one is an RFP or, or RFQ for city owned land. So that's realigning the city facilities, uh, creating great streets, uh, looking at the feasibility of doing some bridge work uh, that, that is proposed in the master plan, uh, marketing this area, making sure that the area has great green infrastructure, stormwater amenities, um, and it provides housing at all at all um, price points um, and then also creating parks uh, not just for the health benefits and ecosystem benefits of parks but also to create a place um, this place of greater scott's edition today especially the diamond um, th it doesn't have as much of like place making elements uh you know and and creating a park as a feature element is is really a, a great attractor 
Um, so on the next slide, you can see a big, a big overview of what this area could potentially look like um, with the two big diagonal streets of Broad, I'm sorry, of uh, Hermitage and Ash um, with Broad on the bottom and the idea of a big green space, a signature green space that ties the development together through the middle um, with, with higher intensity development around it. Uh, and that is made possible really because of this great green space, um, everyone's front door, front lawn, that could be programmed in lots of different ways. So this is the vision. This is a visionary image. Um, it, it's not set in stone. It's not like this is exactly how everything has to happen. But um, but it's just providing people with a, with a great idea of what this could be. So the next slide shows uh, the before image of of this of the standing in the middle of the parking lots at the south end of the city owned land where the diamond sits today and looking down towards the uh, science museum and you can barely see the science museum at, at, in the photograph but in real life it's actually not that far um, but it feels really far because there's nothing connecting you to that the, the two places so this little this center space this green space um, could be a really really great anchor and just destination in this area and all of this this green space uh, is framed with buildings and the next slide shows Kind of this illustrative idea of like what Arthur Ashe Boulevard could look like in the future um, and kind of how there are different modes accommodated, how the buildings address the street, how they have um, active ground floors, parking is, is hidden from the main drag. Um, it's still available because we know people are still driving, but it's still available. It's just not um, impeding, kind of creating a bad pedestrian environment. Um, so the next slide it outlines the framework for this area um, with these ideas of these different districts, A through F. Um, the, A, the A and B districts are, are essentially the E, A, B, and C districts are the ones that are primarily the ones we're talking about um, in the rezoning today. Um, and a lot of that is not zoned um, to, to allow the kind of development, especially residential and higher and higher intensity that we're envisioning for this area. And this plan was created with a lot of input from the community. Um, we hosted uh, several, a couple uh, meetings just focused on this area um, in, in, in the midst of the master planning process, we focused just on this area. So the next slide shows the future land use that we envision for the area with the industrial mixed use. Those are areas that are transitioning from like core industrial uses to other, to allow more uh, non-industrial uses uh, and more height and then the destination mixed use which is essentially downtown outside of downtown uh, so you can see in the dotted line is the study area that we're looking at for the rezoning uh, today that we presented a couple of weeks ago and that we're going over today again um, and in the in the triangle space between ash and hermitage is destination mixed use uh, as we envisioned it back then and then industrial mixed use on the other sides so uh, if you go to the next slide, you can see kind of some images. Uh, if you want more details about what destination mixed use means, um, you can look in the master plan and there's even more detail. But generally, it's um, you know features prominent destinations, retail sports venues, large employers, and it also has housing and open space. Um, it's kind of priming for better transit. Um, or, or it is it is a long major transit or it's getting ready where more, more transit could be successful, kind of pre-TOD, pre-transit oriented development. Um, and then it's generally, I think a lot of people talk about the height, so it's generally a minimum of five stories. It doesn't mean that every building is always five stories um, as, a, as a minimum, but, uh, but generally like wanting a slightly more intensity in this area. So, um, and then the next slide goes over the industrial mixed use and what that what that looks like, um, what that could feel like. Um, generally, three to eight stories ish, um, with with uh, with maker spaces still being allowed within the area, um, but but allowing for residential. Um, really thinking about industrial users that are that wouldn't be uh, like not complementary with residential uh, uses as well. So that's the overview of the master plan. Um, I tried to do it quick because I know a lot of people on this call have already heard it before, but just in case nobody had, 
Um, look through the master plan. There's even more detail about the Greater Scots Edition uh, node in there if you want to learn more. So, Will, go ahead. Great. Thanks, Maritza. Um, so, you know, the question of why are we why are we rezoning Greater Scots Edition and Maritza <coughs> touched on this already, but it's one of the primary next steps in the plan um, to make the zoning in alignment with the future land use to carry out the vision of the area. Uh, the current zoning is no longer al aligning with that future land use that we just talked about. We hope it will reduce, if not eliminate, the need for special use permits. Um, there have been 12 SUPs already since 2000, um, and more more would be coming if we don't change the zoning um, underneath underlying zoning. Um, we're also rezoning this um, because uh, the city is planning to issue an RFP for the city-owned property that's located um, where the diamond is currently and around that area, and um, having the <clears throat> having a, a more you know progressive urban, taller, um, denser zoning district in place will help um, give the RFP process uh, a little more uh, vision about what the city is looking for, and that potential new development there could be really transformative to um, you know catalyze even more development in that in the whole greater Scotts Edition area as well. Um, and this is a, a continuation of some rezoning that we've done already um, nearby. So a few years ago we rezoned uh, Scotts Edition itself um, from M1 and M2 to TOD1 and B7 um, and that was following up from the uh, Pulse Corridor plan before we started with Richmond 300. So this is the existing zoning of Greater Scotts Edition. Um, you can see the existing M1 light industrial in the center um, between you know east of Arthur Ashe Boulevard, Boulevard uh, the M2 heavy industrial to the northwest and then in the southern portion of the area. Uh, there are some recent rezonings that were done per the uh, property owners uh, applying to be rezoned. So that includes the the B5 south of Overbrook, uh, Central Business District, and then TOD1, Transit Oriented Nodal District, um, that was just recently rezoned as of maybe a couple weeks ago um, here just north of the railroad tracks at, at Arthur Ashe Boulevard. You can see the location of the SUPs that have been approved since 2010. Um, so that's the, the current existing zoning. Uh, here is the existing land use. So how each property is classified uh, based on the assessor's office and, and the assessment information. So you can see a lot of um, industrial, obviously some commercial um, mixed in as well. Uh, commercial slash institutional. This uh, there's a city owned property here. Um, you can see the residential uses, the multifamily residential along Overbrook, and this is the areas with the SUPs and the uh, rezonings as well. So it's you know kind of a mix, um, probably you know less industrial than in the past, and that trend is kind of continuing to to evolve as well. And this is the proposed zoning that we're considering, and we want everyone's uh, feedback on. Um, so basically in the center here along uh, Arthur Ashe Boulevard is the TOD1 uh, transit nodal district. So um, this includes the city owned property here and we've made some changes since the last meeting. So we want folks to um, you know, be, be aware of some of those adjustments. Uh, we, ha we have included um, properties on the west side of Arthur Ashe Boulevard <coughs> into the TOD1 uh, area um, properties that aren't necessarily as maybe compatible with the B7, which allows for more light industrial uses. Um, properties that you know would help to create that um, more urban mixed use um, kind of um, very walkable kind of development that was uh, envisioned and that one. Um, uh, rendering shown earlier, so that will help to create that future condition. Uh, TOD one's also found here, um, and this this multifamily project has already happened as well. And 
the majority of the area is B7, um, mixed use business. And I'll get into some of the details about this, um, about these zones in a second. And then we're leaving the B5 for the properties that have already, um, have already applied to be rezoned to B5. So that will remain. Uh, we, we asked folks at the last meeting and during the last um, you know, public comment period whether they thought B5 or B7 would be a better mix for, for this area of the uh, Greater Scottsdale neighborhood. And most folks felt that B7 was a better fit um, either for their properties or just in general. And we'll we'll speak about you know why that why that makes sense um, in the next in the next few slides. So this is a very kind of general uh, rough characterization of each zoning district, um, but the B7 mixed use district would allow for a variety of uses that are not currently allowed in the M1 and M2 districts, like dwelling units. Um, it also allows for a variety of retail service and also distribution and warehousing. And one very unique thing about the B7 district <coughs> is that um, uses that are currently existing in the in the area that's rezoned the B7 would allow that are that are permitted in the M1 and M2 would allow to uh, continue operations and would not become non-conforming. So it's a good uh, zoning district for areas that have um, lighter industrial uses but are transitioning to other mixed uses like residential and commercial. Um, so this is uh, the zoning district that Scott's Titian itself has been rezoned to and um, you know I think that works well for a, for a transitioning kind of um, you know post-industrial um, kind of transitioning neighborhood. So the B7 allows five stories of height uh, six, if you're developing an entire block, has a maximum front yard of 10 feet, so the building can't be any further away than 10 feet from the street. There are special considerations for the form and location of the of any new buildings, um, including uh, driveways and, and, and parking lots not being located off the main street. Um, requirements for windows as well, a certain percentage. Uh, the parking is one space per residential unit, and then commercial is based on the square footage of uh, the use. But there's also a 50% reduction in the required parking for existing buildings. Uh, so the B5 is just those handful of properties that have been rezoned already to B5. Uh, they allow for a variety of retail and, and service uses as well, uh, dwelling units. Uh, similarly, five-story max height with a two-story minimum it also has similar form-based requirements for driveways, parking lots, windows, landscaping, just like the B7 does. Uh, less parking is required in the B5 district, so um, for residential, there's no parking required for a project that has fewer than 16 dwelling units, and then above 16, it's one parking space per four dwelling units. Commercial, none, no parking is required except for hotels and motels, which is uh, based on the number of rooms. Uh, TOD1, so the um, kind of center portion of the neighborhood between Arthur, along Arthur Ashe and then to the east to Hermitage, allows for uh, a variety of retail and, and business service uses dwelling units, it allows for much more height, up to 12 stories max with a two-story minimum. Also has a 10-foot uh, setback from the front yard. Uh, if it's a residential development, so residential on the ground floor, there's a minimum of 10 feet for the front yard. Uh, again, has the same kind of form and window and driveway and parking requirements as the other, other districts. Parking is reduced as well, not as much as the B5, but still no parking is required for a project with fewer than 16 units. And then uh, more over 16 units, it's one per one parking space per two units. Commercial, no parking is required again, except for hotels and motels. So I'm not gonna read all these, but these are the, uh, the permitted principal and accessory uses in the B7 district. You can see it's quite a, quite a list um, so it allows for kind of lighter kind of industrialist uses like, you know, building material sales, um, breweries, but also allows dwelling units. 
um, and a variety of service, retail, business uses. And then uses in the M1 and M2 districts are allowed to exist um, as long as they're already there at the uh, effective date of this uh, rezoning ordinance being being passed. Also allows for a few uses that would need conditional use permits. So these would have to be approved by uh, City Council and Planning Commission. I just went off. There we go. Um, so drive up facilities, motor fuel dispensing, nightclubs, self-service car washes and social service delivery uses all need uh, conditional use permits to be uh, built. This is the B5 district, um, so not as many uses as the B7. It's you know not doesn't really allow for light industrial uses. It's more of a um, commercial slash mixed use type district. Um, so business and services, uh, dwelling units allowed. Also some uses by conditional use permit like nightclubs, parking areas and lots, um, retail sales of liquor. So in the B5, um, Parking lots are not a, a use in by itself. It has to be parking is obviously allowed, but it has to be a part of another use. It can't just be a single um, a property that only has parking on it. And then the TOD one districts, um, kind of similar as the B five, but a few more uses that aren't found in the B five, like breweries. Um, you know, a little bit. A little more expanded manufacturing, warehousing, distribution of food and beverage, but for the most part, uh, businesses, services, dwelling units allowed. And then a couple uses by conditional use permit as well. Another aspect of this rezoning um, are these street designations. <clears throat> and basically, these are uh, kind of form and uh, form requirements that are put in place to help the urban design and the uh, street experience of, of areas um, along Arthur Ashe Boulevard is designated is proposed to be designated and would continue the existing designation of Arthur Ashe as a street oriented commercial frontage. It's also designated as a priority street. And then uh, Hermitage, Sherwood, and Overbrook are also designated priority streets as well. What that means, yeah. On the map, can you talk about how it changed slightly based on input? Yeah, so um, we did hear from um, representatives of this property that recently rezoned uh, to TOD1. Um, so just let them know that we removed the designations along this section that would front their property um, because uh, because the bridge is not at grade. Um, it's actually a pretty big grade separation where it crosses the railroad tracks and there's uh, really no way that having um, you know a, a, a street oriented commercial kind of use would interact with that street at all. Um, the main principal street is actually Boulevard West here for this property. So um, that's one tweak we made. Uh, we didn't see any other circumstances in the areas where, where we have conflicts with this proposal for the street designations. Um, that's one area that we did change from the last iteration. So basically what that means uh, for the street oriented commercial frontage, which would be applied to both sides of Arthur Ashe Boulevard, um, is that for each property, for uh, any new development, it would require that at least one third or a thousand square feet of the um, of the frontage would be a use other than residential. So um, it could be uh, any kind of business or, or you know restaurant kind of use. Um, doesn't have to be strictly commercial, but the idea is that. Um, you know, you have a use other than residential, so it's not just people's apartment units with their blinds closed all day. It's it's like some kind of actual um, activity along the street, and it's a requirement to be 20 feet deep, which isn't a lot of space, but that's only the minimum. Um, folks have done more than that to make more of a uh, more of a space. Like if they were planning a restaurant, they would definitely want more than 20 feet in depth. Um, that's just the minimum to have some kind of usable space. 
And then the other designation, the, the blue lines, um, are called Priority Street. And basically, um, what this tries to do is designate streets that should be treated to a, a higher standard. Um, it kind of has the same requirements as if the street was the, the principal street of a, of a property, which is like the street that it fronts up, fronts upon. Um, the idea being that if like you're a corner, corner site, you know, if you have to, uh, if, if like Arthur Ashe is your main street, your, your fronting street, um, there are certain requirements, but then if you put side street also, if it's important enough, doesn't, you know, just get shortchanged altogether. So, um, those streets mentioned Hermitage, Overbrook, um, uh, Sherwood, I believe, um, would have special requirements for driveways not being located along them unless there's no other way to access the site. Parking lots would have to be, um, you know, behind the buildings, not fronting those streets. Parking decks and even hotels would have to be wrapped in some other use, kind of like the street-oriented commercial requirements. Um, and also the requirements for windows would apply to those other priority streets as well. And then finally, just want to talk about non-conforming uses. So this has been mentioned before, but um, basically what a non-conforming use is, it happens when uh, there's an existing use and it's no longer allowed by right because the underlying zoning has changed. Uh, typically, that, typically that means a building can't be enlarged or moved, altered structurally. Um, it's allowed to remain, you know, and, and, and be, you know, maintained, um, but it, it can't be expanded. And there's certain implications, perhaps, with uh, business loans and that kind of thing for for a property. So, um, the different districts being proposed all handle these non-conforming uses differently. Um, so, as mentioned before, the B7 district would allow for any existing uses that are allowed in the M1 and M2 districts to actually not become non-conforming. They can actually um, expand and, and be rebuilt. They can obviously be maintained and, and continue to operate. That's only for existing uses. So if a new M1 or M2 use uh, wanted to locate, but it wasn't allowed in the B7, that would not be allowed uh, by right. The B5 districts, um, just those few properties uh, shown in the map in red, um, the, the uses that are not allowed in the B5 that are existing would become non-conforming, but could still be maintained and rebuilt and even expanded up to 10%. And then finally, the TOD1 district has a more, um, I guess, traditional take on non-conforming uses that most other districts in the zoning ordinance do, which is um, basically that you, you cannot alter or expand it. Um, we need to get permission uh, approval from the Board of Zoning Appeals for any kind of expansion, but that is limited to 10% of the floor area. So those are kind of how existing uses that are not allowed uh, in the new districts would be would be treated in these uh, three different zoning districts being proposed for the area. So this is the uh, timeline for this effort. Uh, we are here today, April 13, the second meeting of the two that we're planning to have. Uh, we're going to have a uh, comment period run through until April 26, so that gives about a couple weeks for uh, folks to um, either voice concerns or ask questions or uh, speak with us about um, any kind of changes that uh, should be done to this proposal. And assuming everything goes relatively smoothly, we will um, in June of uh, just a couple months from now be introducing this for adoption. And there will be, you know, two more public hearings. So this this is the last kind of informal public meeting, but there's still a chance for you know public input at, at both of these um, both of these hearings. The first one would be June 21st. The planning commission would um, hopefully recommend approval of this rezoning, and then um, it would go to city council on June 28th for final adoption. So that's where we're at, um, but we're still looking for feedback and we're 
Uh, happy to answer any questions folks have. The rezoning website is listed there, and that's a good way to stay up to date about what's um, going on with this and to look at any updates. Um, the rezoning map is posted there, and, and that will get updated if there's any changes between now and the uh, introduction of, of the actual ordinance to rezone. Um, and I'm, we're just asking folks to call or email me um, to talk through any questions or concerns they have. So my email is listed there and my phone number as well. Uh, so please reach out and be happy, happy to speak with you. Uh, but for right now, we're gonna open it up for, for Q&A. Um, so should have plenty of time for that. I don't know if there's any questions in the chat or if folks have had their hands raised, you can, you can raise your hand and we'll uh, call on you and have you uh, have you speak. So I think that's how we're gonna handle this portion of the of the meeting. I don't see any questions in the chat right now. I have allowed everyone to unmute yourself. So if you want to use the raise your hand function, we can call on you to unmute. If there's any questions. Oh. Yes, Julie. Hi, I have two questions if I could. Could you talk about what you think the longer term impact of this is going to be on the Newtown and Carver neighborhoods? As you look at this down the road, what you think uh, the impact of that's going to be on those those places? And then I have a second question. Sure. Um, so, I mean, you know, obviously we're not uh, changing the zoning um, for Newtown or Carver with, with this rezoning. Um, you know, I wouldn't expect this rezoning to have any uh, immediate impact on either of those neighborhoods, um, just given the, you know, maybe with the exception of increased uh, traffic nearby, uh, there is some separation between uh, the existing neighborhoods because of the existing railroad tracks and the interstate. Um, you do have this TOD1 zoned area here, which is pretty close to Newtown, but um, you know, a lot of this is, is an existing use already. The uh, what, stove top or uh, lofts, apartments. Um, so I don't foresee a huge impact to those neighborhoods with this. Thank you. And my um, it it could also um, result in like more services and amenities. I mean, we don't planners don't planners can control use insofar as like. The use is permitted in different districts, but then property owners decide what kind of business they want to put in. Um, so like, you know, the fact that there's some breweries in that own B area, um, those are kind of new things that didn't exist before that people who live nearby could go to or could be employed at. Um, so it could just provide more things to go to and places to like, shop or you know the ballpark obviously um, and also more places for more people to live um, which could help um, attract things like grocers or um, any kind of other amenities that might be looking for more rooftops. Um, my second question was can you talk a bit about um, you're thinking around what you're requiring in all of this with dwellings that is affordable housing that seems to sort of always get swept under the rug. Can you exp uh, talk a bit about that, please? Sure. So um, the, the property that is owned by the city, um, which is the, the part where the ballpark is, um, as the city disposes of that land, um, it can uh, require in an RFQ or RFP process uh, that any residential units that are made be uh, provided at certain income levels. Um, so that's that's kind of one of the strongest ways that the city can mandate in, in, as housing or affordable housing, and that can be for sale or rental. Um, in terms of private owners, um, Private owners, I know the city is working on an update to the affordable housing density bonus, but there is an affordable housing density bonus program right now that um, that folks can take advantage of to help provide lower income housing units. 
Um, Kevin, you're on the line too. If you have anything else to add to my response, you can chime in. Um, he's the planning director, the acting planning director. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think one of the challenges we have, um, you know, with our zoning tools, um, you know, through the Commonwealth, we we are not enabled to legislate or, or directly require um, inclusionary zoning or specify types of affordable housing. Um, as you know, Ms. Peachin had mentioned, I think we we are in the process of working on. Um, right now, the Commonwealth had some enabling legislation um, to allow us to maybe to offer some more incentives or call it carrots to, to get this done. And so we're we're working on that um, through our portfolio to, to to see if there's some options for for doing that. Um, you know, one of the things that we um, want to do is I think with some of these zoning categories and um, providing opportunities, um, you know, for affordable housing. Uh, I think the the zoning that allows for um, potentially more dense development to potentially lower the per cost unit um, are things that we can do, you know, through some of the um, you know zoning um, tools that we have in place right now. Um, but but with that, um, I, I think one of the things that we we don't have is is the requirement to to regulate it. Um, but we're being able to continue to work on incentives to hopefully encourage it to move forward. So, um, you know, while, while this, um, you know, I, I don't want to say it, it gets swept under the rug because it is something that I think, uh, you know, as Peachin can attest to it, we are talking a lot about, um, you know, through our department and through the community and then definitely looking to implement, um, I, I think the mayor's made it quite clear um, in our council and that it is a priority for our community. So. Um, while our zoning tools may not be the exact um, applications in which to achieve that, um, I think what we can do is, is make sure that they are in a place that allows, once we do have incentives in place, um, those projects to move forward more quickly. Um, may I just um, follow through on that with one question or comment? And that is, uh, as someone who is- well, you, We have other people who have, well, we'll have questions. So just, uh, this can be your last question so we can get to this. No, no, this is not a question, it's just a comment. And that is that having worked in affordable housing for many years, the, the city needs to be really careful in the way you talk about affordable housing, putting up more units that will be taken by young professionals really is not affordable housing in the sense of people who have true needs. And I hope that you'll consider with places, and I don't live in either of these neighborhoods, but when you're considering places like Carver and Newtown, those are now pockets of affordable housing, which are will be in great jeopardy of no longer being affordable. So I think it's both what you're taking away and what you're adding. And I really hope that you'll be thinking about that entire loop as you think about how you work around that. Thank you very much. All right, we have a question in the chat. The concept for green space currently includes, as I understand it, a greenway path to connect Northside with Lee Street. What is the mechanism to ensure the green space and greenway are part of any development? Maurice, you want to speak to that? Yeah, so um, the easiest way to include green space, so there are open space requirements in the zoning ordinance um, that, that property owners provide open space. Um, now, the, the best way to provide publicly accessible like parkland is through city owned land. Um, so that is why we're kind of putting, using a big chunk of the city owned land in the center of the image there um, to to, to dedicate it to parkland. Um, in terms of the bridge and a greenway and uh, those things, some of that stuff um, and some of these ideas aren't all on city owned land. Um, like some of the green spaces and parks that you see, um, we're just kind of suggesting them as future ideas that might help with placemaking and connectivity. Um, so those are things that we have to um, continue to work with partners uh, to help undertake. Uh, if you think about the, the Virginia Capitol Trail, which is such a great uh, pedestrian bikeway that connects Williamsburg to uh, Richmond, that the Capitol Trail itself is not on all publicly owned right of way. A, a lot of it is on easements. 
that that found, that they secured with property owners. So some of these uh, ideas have to get done through easements, and it's not just publicly owned um, land or projects. And I think it's a little bit of like putting the idea out there and then figuring out how we make it happen um, project by project. Um, I just want to say and, and welcome uh, Councilwoman uh, Jordan, who's on the call. I don't know if um, if you wanted to uh, speak to this or, or um, give any, any kind of input or framing of, of this proposed rezoning. Just wanted to thank her for, for being here and, and give her the opportunity to speak if she uh, wishes to do so. Oh, thank you very much. And I'm here to listen to other people's reactions. Um, I came from a neighborhood association in the north side and missed the beginning of this presentation, but I will be watching it online and I always appreciate that these are recorded. I did have a question from the north side. Um, can you let us know what the future traffic engineering is for that 95 um, interchange that goes to Laburnum? I guess it, you know, near the registrar's office. Um. I don't think we don't have that as part of this. It's kind of north of this. It's way north of this project okay. um, area. Um, but I know that those are conversations that uh, DPW has been having and, and the planning department has been looped into those. Um, but I, I don't I don't know the answer right now to that okay. question. Thank you. I didn't know if it perhaps was relevant since this is becoming more of a destination area. Um, the ease to which that people could get on and off of 95, especially if they're coming from a squirrels game. But um, I can get that feedback offline and appreciate you doing this meeting tonight. And I, I wanted to touch on something that the other person mentioned. Uh, I think it was Julie. Um, the master plan provides um, some recommendations related to existing residents um, and making sure and, and trying to put in programs and plans to help existing residents uh, remain in their homes. Um, and so we are trying to collaborate uh, with Virginia LISC uh, and other entities uh, to help. And then also like there's ideas of exploring uh, tax, tax, reducing tax bills for people who are longer term residents. Um, and then also helping people with grants for repairing their homes um, who are longer term residents to help make those more affordable to them. Um, let's see. If you're on the phone and you'd like to ask a question, it's star six to unmute yourself. Oh, we have another comment in the chat. I really look forward to greater density and more amenities in this area, along with greater bike and pedestrian friendliness. Thank you, Jason. Um, so we will shared kind of the timeline at the end of his presentation on what the next steps are for public meetings and um, just to be clear, like on June 21st, when the Planning Commission has their hearing, it's going to be their hearing on like voting on a, a, a plan. And by that point, the legislation has already been introduced. So at that point, like it's kind of, it'd be really great. What I'm trying to say is it'd be really great to get people's feedback um, on this before we go to the uh, City Council, um, just so that we understand um, we can make adjustments. Uh, we can we can talk through some of the different ideas um, before we go to the hearings. So make sure that you email or call Will Palmquist. And if you're on the phone, it's William Palmquist at richmondgov.com. With a period between the first and last name. Ah, thank you. William dot Palmquist. That's P A L M Q U I S C at richmondgov.com. And again, this is on our city's website with the rezoning information. Let's see, I kind of said those things to see if anything else would come out as an idea or question. <laughs> Oh, 
If there are no other questions or comments, um, please be in touch with us. We want to hear your thoughts um, and share it. If you are a community member, I saw that Scott's edition Boulevard Association shared the information, um, but please uh, share the presentation with other folks who uh, may have missed it. I think we're good then. Yeah. <laughs> All right, everyone, have a nice night. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Oh. Thank you.